Here we go. Bam! What's good, everyone? It's propping on here. Uh, well, we're living in a brave new world indeed. You know, the U.S. government finally acknowledged the reality of UFOs. So they're real now, is what they're telling us, right? Uh, but why does it feel weird? Why does it feel the timing or just the people who are talking about it right now? It all feels a little funny, right? So uh, maybe Adam Go Rightly has some answers for us. Uh, his new book, Saucer, Spooks, and Kooks, UFO Disinformation in the Age of Aquarius, uh, has recently been published by Daily Grail Publishing. Uh, and it lays out very nicely the history of U.S. government-sponsored domestic disinformation campaigns meaning that's U.S. government-sponsored mindfuckery of its own citizens since World War II. Uh, so these campaigns began immediately after World War II and still continue to this day. Uh, Adam is the author of uh, many great books, which include The Prankster and the Conspiracy, a uh, biography of uh, one of the founders of Discordianism, Kerry Thornley, uh, another book called Caught in the Crossfire, also about Kerry Thornley and his dealings with uh, Jim Garrison and the JFK assassination investigation. Very good read. And also Historica Discordia, a uh, history of early Discordianism. Uh, super psyched to have him on today. Uh, this book was a great read. Uh, I would recommend it along with the documentary Mirage Men uh, by Mark Pilkington and also uh, Greg Bishop's book, Project Beta. Um, so yeah, Adam, how you feeling, man? Ah, great, thanks for having me on, prop. And I'm, <laughs> um, so I, uh, I guess just wanted to get into, you know, the, how you, you know, let's just unpack it step by step of the, 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 the campaigns, the disinfo campaigns that were, uh, you know, uh, instituted basically right at the beginning of the, the, the saucer uh, crash story. Um, but before we, we kind of really dig in, I just like to, to ask you, like um, uh, you mentioned, this was a, a book that, that took a while to, to uh, finally crystallize. Um, what was the impetus of the book? What, what, was, what got the book started for you? The impetus uh, was a interview with a guy named uh, Tal Levesque. Well, oh, my gosh, more than uh, 10 years ago or so. And that uh, initially was just going to be a long article I wrote called My Breakfast with Tal, which appears as a uh, chapter in the book. But then, as you'll uh, discover if you uh, read the book, uh, Tal Levesque was key in propagating, among other things, the Dulce base mythos. And so uh, after I met with uh, Tal and interviewed him and started interacting with him, I started looking deeper into the Dulce base mythos. And, uh, and so that original article I planned just kind of kept uh, growing to the point where it really wasn't an article anymore. It was, it was becoming a book. And uh, beyond the Dulce base uh, mythos, I saw how a lot of these other stories in UFO lore were kind of all connected uh, to uh, Talavesque and the Dulce base story and Paul Benowitz and Richard Doty were connected to uh, the Dulce base story, but they were also connected with promoting the MJ-12 materials back in the uh, 1980s. And that story kind of connects to Area 51 and what was going on uh, there. So all of this over time just kept growing and uh, growing. And like I said, I spent probably more than 10 years on it because it was one of those things that I'd work on for a while and put on the back burner. Then I was working on other, you know, some of the Discordian related uh, books and probably about after I got all of those out of the way f about five years ago, I finally settled in and said that, my God, I'm going to finish this book. And I f <laughs> finally did around uh, last year or so. 
Oh, well, uh, I'm glad that you did. I, I think it's uh, one of your best works so far, man. Me too. Yeah, right. Good, man. Um, congratulations, you know, and uh, the, um, I think what's, what's really well done is just, you know, how clearly you lay it out. Um, you know, beginning with, uh, was it in 1950, when uh, that book written by Frank Scully, mm -hmm. uh, you know, based on an, an interview of that guy, Silas Newton. And, you know, as you write in the book, um, the Scully was told that he was visited by some uh, government agents who he was unsure of what department or, or who, where they were from. And they told him that the information that he put in his book was, was false, but to also keep putting it out there and I guess, you know, lecturing or, you know, talking about it to the media. Um, and, um, you know, just, just how you, you, you kind of like step by step, just provide each story. Um, just wondering, like, uh, I mean, can we trace it through a little bit from, you know, for the people who haven't read the book yet, you know, like from 1950 until, you know, Paul Benowitz, like mm -hmm. um, what, how many sort of campaigns, if you will, did, did you come across or what, what were some of the, the, um, you know, the stories, well, just like that, like about Frank Scully, like um, they went to Scully, they told him to, to keep, uh, perpetuating the lie? Was it him that they went to? Yeah, you know, and that's the story too. That uh, there was a, a researcher named Carl Flock who uh, looked into uh, the Roswell crash, uh, for instance, and he was a f former um, CIA, he worked for the CIA in some capacity, so that's how he. Uh, caught wind of that story that these government agents, whoever they were, were not quite exactly sure. You know, there's no documentation beyond Carl Flock that that actually happened. But uh, so, you know, you get into an area of what is disinformation as opposed to what is uh, misinformation, you know, and, you know, disinformation is uh, really orchestrated targeted uh, campaign to deceive or promote some false narrative, you know? And so that's part of uh, UFO lore over the years, the different disinformation, but then you have misinformation as well. People pick up on some of these false stories or they uh, unintentionally uh, pass along uh, bad information, you know, or uh, sketchy information about some type of UFO events, not uh, necessarily uh, intending to spread disinformation, but, you know, spreading misinformation. So, that, yeah, there's different types of uh, bad information that get out there. And in the case of uh, Scully is interesting in that uh, book he uh, wrote and repeated the story which was based on bunk <laughs> information that uh, Silas Newton and the, this other character gave him or passed along that there had been a crash in uh, Aztec New Mexico and uh, trying to remember the uh, date they had on it but it really doesn't matter it was probably a bullshit uh, story but it was in the late uh, 40s and that kind of started the crash uh, flying saucer mythos and later the the that aztec story or the st story uh, frank scully passed along was basically uh repeated in the uh, roswell crash story it had all the uh, same elements and you see these patterns again and again there's been a number of uh s quote unquote supposed uh, ufo crashes that happened uh during that uh period, you know, uh, in the late 40s and uh, 50s, and whatever actually happened, if there was crashes, I mean, in some accounts, you know, they say it was government weather balloons, perhaps the uh, UFO crash meme to cover up what was going on there with, uh, you know, a lot of 
the the mogul weather balloons, uh, for instance, which were used to uh, basically weather balloons. They'd launch, and they were the government was monitoring uh, radiation levels of you know if there was a uh, atomic uh, bomb testing going on uh, in other places, Russia or wherever, those uh, balloons could pick up on uh, that. And uh, that, you know, that's part of the uh, whole Roswell crash mythos. There's different theories and explanations. And uh, one of them was that it was one of these uh, mogul balloons. And so, uh, you know, you get into disinformation and uh, start asking the questions. Well, was you know this the whole Roswell crash story devised to uh, cover up something else? Indeed, yeah. And uh, you do a great job in the book of unpacking that, um, and then you also deliver, um, which maybe we could get into uh, a little later on about what may have been actually covered up, what mm -hmm. government uh, programs may have been covered up. Um, moving along though, like um, when was uh, Project Gas Buggy? When, when was that? Yeah, that's a, an important part of uh, the Dulce Base story. And that was at 1967 near, in the area of Dulce, uh, New Mexico, there were these experimental uh, atomic bomb blasts, underground blasts, and what they were doing was uh, basically it was an early form of uh, fracking. They were trying to uh, release natural gas reserves, then trap them and, you know, be able to use those. And, uh, but it didn't quite work out, you know, once <laughs> after the bomb blast, it uh, this is something the Department of Energy was doing. Uh, they couldn't uh, control the uh, gas or the radiation was a byproduct that uh, leaked out, you know, so it, it, it was unsuccessful. But uh, what is said to have uh, happened in relation to uh, the Dulce story, and this is one of, one, one of the many... Uh, Oh, theories or claims uh, regarding that was this bomb blast uh, created an underground uh, cavern, which was later expanded upon and uh, was used to build this uh, secret Dulce base where supposedly aliens and the government would later have a uh, secret treaty. And yeah, a lot of, to unpack here, but uh, <laughs> so when we get to, uh, this kind of brings in the whole uh, Paul Benowitz, uh, Richard Doty uh, story. And so that was 67 uh, Project uh, Gas Buggy. And that, like I said, that was in the area of uh, Dulce, New Mexico and the Hickoria Indian uh, Reservation. And uh, in the mid 70s is when a lot of the um, cattle mutilations uh, started in that area and across the American uh, Southwest. And um, also in uh, oftentimes in combination with uh, these uh, mutilations, there was UFO sightings. Sometimes there was uh, black helicopter sightings. And, conjunction with UFO uh, sightings. And I get into uh, Gabe Valdez. He was a state trooper there in uh, Dulce, New Mexico. He was one of the first people looking into this uh, phenomenon, uh, along with a lot of other people trying to figure out uh, what was uh, going on. And uh, so he became one of the advocates pushing to find out, you know, who are mutilating these uh, cattle and bringing them to justice. And along the way, he uh, encountered all this high weirdness. Once again, uh, strange lights that were seen in tandem or in the same areas as these uh, mutilations, as well as uh, sometimes, you know, these military helicopters. And so there was a lot of theories swirling around what was uh, going on here. One, one of them is that uh, cattle uh, 
really make good subjects for testing radiation and cancer. And so, you know, that's one of the uh, theories that the government were testing these uh, cattle. That's why they were, the mutilations were uh, happening and that they were using uh, reports or false reports of uh, UFOs once again in tandem with these uh, helicopters. But inevitably at the end of the day, there was so much going on here and maybe uh, so much disinformation and misinformation uh, with these cases that nobody could ever really figure out exactly what uh, was going on with all of this. But this was an area, Paul Benowitz, who uh, was uh, basically a physicist and he had a company called uh, Thunder Dynamics. I'm forgetting the name now, but he did government uh, contract and avionics and aviation. And he uh, lived near uh, Kirtland Air Force uh, Base, and he was a UFO uh, enthusiast, shall we say. He b belonged to the uh, APRO, which was one of the early uh, UFO organizations, and he was also a interested in cattle mutilations as well. And he was a friend of uh, Gabe Valdez, and so he was looking into all of this uh, stuff. Uh, and the thing that really got him going on uh, UFO uh, sightings was he lived adjacent to Kirtland Air Force Base, as I said, which hosts Sandia Labs and uh, also the Monsanto's uh, weapons area that at the time, and we're now we're in the uh, late 70s, hosted the largest uh, cache of nuclear weapon uh, components and it was over uh, this Monsanto weapons area once again in Kirtland base adjacent to his house that he started seeing some strange lights UFOs you know right over this facility which uh, alarmed him he felt it was a national security threat he started uh, filming these things he also he's kind of a mad genius dude he was setting up uh, different type of listening devices to pick up signals and whatnot. And he also started uh, picking up these uh, signals as well, which over time he became, began to believe were communications uh, of aliens. And uh, so he started reporting this to the officials at uh, Kirtland Base, one of whom was uh, Richard Doty, who plays uh, a pretty large role in the disinformation uh, angle of this uh, story. So, boy. So, a very uh, large role. Yeah. Um, and so, like I said, he reported that to uh, the officials at uh, Kirtland, wanted to get some, tried to get a government uh, contract from them uh, to do more. Uh, research and what was uh, going on and they kind of humored him but he felt they weren't uh, taking him uh, seriously and so he started contacting uh, different uh, state senators or the U.S. senator uh, for uh, New Mexico there was a couple Pete Domenici and Harrison Schmidt and he was passing on information because one of the things that happened during this uh, period. They had some sightings over uh, Kirtland. This kind of plays into what's going on now, all, you know, with this interest in UFOs or UAPs. Are they national security threats? Are they aliens? What the hell's going on? We have a report coming out. Could be any day now. Could be uh, tomorrow. And uh, when some of these events were happening over uh, Kirtland, it was quite a, quite a serious thing that made it into the newspaper. In fact, one of these incidents, the uh, when the sightings took place, the power went uh, completely off and uh, off everything went offline at the Albuquerque uh, airport there, which is a huge, you know, pretty big uh, hub airport for that uh, period. So that you know these. Uh, threats of uh, unidentified objects, UAPs they call them, uh, and it 
unidentified aerial phenomena are, are not uh, new and you know during the uh, 70s and 80s uh, particularly they had a lot of these they you know called them incursions over military bases that's the common theme a lot of these things happen over uh, military bases more recently you know with these sightings or over aircraft carriers adjacent to those or close to them so that that's kind of a common uh, theme but um, so what was going on at uh, Kirtland this was um, the late 70s into the 80s when a lot of the stealth aircraft uh, testing was going on and a lot of it was going on there at uh, Kirtland that's some of the stuff that uh, Benowitz was seen as well as I told you he was picking up these signals that was later as far as uh, I've been able to term determine a lot of people who've looked into this they were testing these uh, laser communications with satellites and so Benowitz was uh, picking these up and it be became a uh, concern with the uh, officials there at uh, Kirtland and the security uh, people they weren't so much concerned about aliens they were concerned with Benowitz was he f and was he you know he was uh, capturing all these signals and what was he doing with them was he figuring out how this uh, classified program worked with communicating to satellites was he passing on this information to uh, uh, you know uh, spies uh, Russian nationals uh, Chinese nationals a lot of those uh, Russian and Chinese spies at the same time were infiltrating or uh, interacting with uh, different UFO groups and of course uh, Benowitz belonged to those type of uh, groups and a lot of people involved in uh, ufology and with these UFO groups at the time also worked in the civilian aviation industry so you can see how these things uh, all overlap and so as this was going on I, at uh, the uh, OF, OF excuse me, AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, in which uh, Doty belonged to, there at uh, Kirtland started this counterintelligence operation. And that's, you know, that's the disinformation campaign. That's one aspect of a counterintelligence operation. And they started this to find out what did Benowitz know? What did he figure out about all these things he were was filming and making recordings of and uh, as as part of this this word Doty Doty's role comes in there was uh, feeding uh, these alien stories to uh, Benowitz in the hopes that he would uh, for instance call a press conference and uh, say there's an alien invasion going on and basically uh, discredit himself uh, he didn't necessarily have a press conference but this is kind of what happened to uh, Benowitz over uh, time and he uh, ultimately uh, kind of went uh, off his head with all of this uh, stuff and he had to be committed to a mental uh, institution for a uh, period of time. Right and so that seems to be one aspect of this information aimed at a target group or an individual, which is to have them float an idea that will later be disproven uh, or, you know, considered absurd and making them lose some sort of respect in the eyes of the public or whatever, but then also to weed people out, correct? Like also to float information to, to, to see who, who, who takes it or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that, that's exactly, that's what Doty got into trouble uh, for. I mean, a lot of this is uh, pretty murky and we don't know things uh, for sure, but I've been, uh, Greg Valdez has written a pretty good book on this. The Dulce uh, story was uh, Gabe Valdez's uh, son. And that's uh, what he said that, that when uh, there was one point like in 84, 
and it was around 84. It was after all, and there was a uh, FOIA released in the early 80s where Doty got kind of uh, busted for uh, leaking bits and pieces of classified uh, information. Some of his, you know, some of this information was uh, that he passed on to other researchers. You know, there was nuggets of true classified information in there mixed up with all the uh, alien uh, stories. And so, and uh, according to Greg Valdez, that's how Doty got in trouble, lost his uh, ranking as a uh, special agent, and eventually ended up in the uh, mess hall there at uh, Kirtland. But um, let's see, where was I going with this? So, um, and so that kind of brings us to the, uh, this is all related to the uh, Dulce story because that was part of the uh, disinformation passed on to uh, Benowitz. And let me give you a little thumbnail of what the uh, Dul what Dulce base is or supposedly, <laughs> allegedly was. And... Uh, and, you know, and if you, I guess if somebody went and Googled Dulce Base, they'd come across stuff that uh, basically said this, it was a rumored underground installation that uh, was a joint uh, venture, part of a secret treaty between uh, aliens and the U.S. government. It's in the area of uh, near Dulce, Hikapia. Hickory Indian Reservation, an, an area called Archuleta Mesa, and uh, in this underground uh, facility, like I said, there was this uh, supposed treaty between reptilian aliens, I think alien grazers, their helpers there, and uh, the treaty basically said that uh, or the agreement between the government and the aliens was that the aliens would uh, share their secret uh, technology and in return the uh, government would uh, green light letting the aliens uh, use humans to experiment upon and uh, and this led to these grisly experiments and like, you know, the alien human hybrids and the vats and everything you saw later on X, X files in the mid nineties and other uh, films and all of this led to supposedly, once again, this is the legend, the fabled Dulce war where a bunch of uh, workers, the, uh, government workers there, human workers, in cahoots with some aliens, uh, formed this resistance to fight back against these experimentations and uh, war erupted and 66 humans uh, were killed or 66 uh, people that were part of this resistance. Some of them are aliens, I guess. It's all bullshit anyway, but <laughs> this was the uh, story. And um, from this, uh, everybody died except this guy named Thomas Castello, who was like a lead uh, worker there. He had, apparently had a flash gun that could vaporize the alien, so he was able to hightail it out of there with uh, video footage and photographs and everything that would blow the whistle on this uh, secret uh, program at uh, Dulce. So that became the Dulce base story and the uh, Dulce War is part of that. <clears throat> but it, all of this, you know, and that, that really started in the late 80s when that information, people became aware of that, something called the Dulce Papers, which we can talk about maybe a little later if we need to. But this, go, this once again goes back to uh, Benowitz and uh, it really came from information that he developed uh, in the uh, late uh, 70s when he was writing these U.S. senators and uh, different uh, folks even wrote to President Ronald Reagan alerting him what was uh, going on in his belief that there was a secret underground uh, base at Dulce. In fact, one of the early documents uh, Benowitz uh, writes that he sent off to one of these senators 
that he had knowledge of this confrontation and how the humans had abandoned the base. That's in one of the uh, early uh, documents that he sent out and that he was also like in the early 80s developing some kind of a space gun. So all of this stuff kind of worked it itself into the Dulce uh, base uh, mythos. And uh, s another part of this is a lady named uh, Myrna Hansen. I'm getting into a lot of uh, details here, but you, you kind of got to, to tell the whole uh, story. So bear with me a well, little bit. To, to, un to unpack that as well, and also to uh, say that I think I have like five minutes left on this particular. Uh, oh, wow. That, that yeah. went fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we can, we can do the next one as well. I have it also scheduled if you like. Um, okay. But, uh, um, to, to kind of just quickly say that you laying out um, that, that sort of Paul Benowitz was uh, thinking some out wild things uh, based on strange lights that he was seeing. And when he spoke to the office, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, um, they encouraged him to keep thinking such wild things and then even sent out Richard Doty to encourage such wild thoughts. And that's kind of how this uh, Dulce base papers mythos uh, grew some legs, would you say, from that infusion of the, you know, someone like Doty encouraging Benowitz in, mm -hmm. you know, delusion, his, his delusion? Yeah, let me... Uh... Just to bolster that a little bit, uh, how much time did you say we have? We have like, it'll shut off, I guess, in five minutes. Okay, <laughs> let me see if I can uh, go over all this. So in uh, 19, May of 1980, this gal named Myrta Hansen uh, was with her son driving through Eagle Next, uh, New Mexico, uh, and she had a UFO uh, sighting. She and her uh, son, and the first thing they saw was a cow get sucked up into a, a spaceship and then on a, like a tractor beam. And she and her son uh, shortly after were sucked up on, in there and they saw a, the aliens dissecting a cow. He had a damn mutilation going on in a uh, flying saucer. And uh, Anyway, she witnessed this event, whatever happened, and uh, afterwards she contacted the police there in Cimarron, New Mexico, and they didn't know what to do with this story, but they knew about Gabe Valdez. Uh, he was go-to guy for flying saucers and cattle mutilation stories, so uh, Gabe Valdez was friends with Paul Benowitz at this point. He contacted uh, Benowitz and to see if he could be of help because uh, uh, Benowitz had contacts with his uh, UFO organization. And it was uh, Benowitz who brought in a um, hypnotic regression uh, expert, Leo Sprinkle, uh, to work with uh, Myrna Hansen. And they did this regression in uh, Benowitz's uh, garage in his Lincoln Town car. He was adamant they put... Uh, aluminum foil all over the car because at this point Benowitz believed that the aliens were trying to beam them and tamper with their uh, regressions of uh, Myrna Hansen. Uh, Myrna Hansen remembered other incidents. They had a series of regressions and one of these was her being taken to an underground base where she went under some type of medical experiment. She had an implant lodged in her head uh, somewhere. And, uh, you know, a lot of the classic uh, UFO ET uh, tropes. And at one point she broke loose and uh, she saw your, these uh, alien human hybrids in vats. And that seemed kind of like uh, really one of the first versions of this uh, story. So, uh, and so Benowitz, he, after hearing this, uh, you know, working with uh, Hanson, now he began to believe that, yeah, it was uh, 
this was this happened at Dulce Base, where she was taken to when she abducted. And of course, uh, Benowitz and others uh, encouraged, uh, uh, or excuse me, Doty and others encouraged Benowitz along this uh, line that there indeed was this uh, secret base at uh, Dulce. And one of the uh, really mind-blowing uh, stories here, and this is we have one minute on this session. One of the mind-blowing stories here, uh, the UFO researcher Bill Moore was in the middle of this uh, too, and Moore talked to Alan Hynek, who's famous in UFO circles. He worked on Project uh, Blue Book, Source for Close Encounters of the Third Kind. According to Hynek, who was still under uh, contract with the UF, U.S. Uh, Air Force at that uh, point in time, he uh, passed on a computer with uh, software to Benowitz that would allow Benowitz to communicate uh, with the alien. 